Hi class, this is your instructor Megan and in this video I want to talk about perceptual organization. So last week we looked at theories of perception, theories of cognitive perception. We looked at direct perception or bottom up, constructivist perception or top down. So these theories were attempting to explain cognition. These theories attempt to explain how the mind derives understanding from visual stimuli. So we know that our eye sees the world and that the stimuli our eyes bring in are processed by the brain. And from that, we gain understanding. But what we don't know for sure is whether, you know, what the mechanism for this is. Are we processing the visual stimuli because the stimuli themselves have all the information we need to understand them, which would be direct perception? Or are we understanding the stimuli because we're able to sort out what we're seeing based on our prior experience and our knowledge? That would be a constructivist perception. We don't know for sure which of those happen, which of those occurs, although evidence suggests that they both have something to do with how we perceive and perceive the world and how that cognitive act works. This week we're going to look at Gestalt theory. This is not the same concept. Gestalt theory isn't trying to understand cognition like the last set of theories were. Instead, Gestalt theory is trying to explain the laws that govern our visual abilities. So bottom up, top down, it's not what we're talking about here in Gestalt theory. Uh, what Gestalt theory is about is trying to understand why when we look at a scene, we tend to see it as a whole. So in the late 1890s, cognitive and behavioral scientists were trying to understand this phenomenon. They said, you know, when we look at a desk, we don't see a notebook and a desk and a computer. We see the, a desk. We can conceptualize everything we see as a desk. When we look at a backyard, we don't see a swing set and then we see the barn and then we see the grass and then we see a tree. We see a whole image of a backyard and we understand, hey, that's a backyard. And then we sort of can look at, oh, look at that tree or, oh, look at the swing set. But we see the whole first. So Gestalt theorists were trying to understand, well, they're trying to explain this phenomenon. And a good example to kind of pick apart Gestalt theory and understand what it's really trying to do is Sunday Afternoon by Georges Seurat. This is a very famous painting. It's in the style of pointillism. It's actually at the Art Institute of Chicago. So if you ever go up to Chicago, go to the Art Institute and go see it. Many of you have probably seen it in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, there's a scene in Ferris Bueller's Day Off where Ferris Bueller and his friends go to the Art Institute and his friend Cameron sort of stares at this painting. <laughs> it's a really interesting scene. I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. What's interesting about this painting that helps us understand Gestalt theory is that when you first laid eyes on this, when I pulled it up, what did you see? You probably saw a park, people at a park. You understood this immediately to be a gathering of people at some outdoor location. And after you understood that, you probably started looking around at the different people. So after you take in the whole, you start to look at the individuals and you see, oh, there's a dog and a monkey playing together. Um, there's a big dog right there. There's two people who appear to be on a date. Uh, here's a family. Uh, there's people out here boating. There's rowers. Uh, there's someone here with, a, it's like a looking glass of some kind. There's soldiers. Here's people who appear to be on a date. So it's only after you've understood the whole picture that you start to look at the specifics. You see the whole first, oh, seen in a park. Then you see the parts, the individual characters. Now the other reason this is such a great painting for understanding Gestalt theory is that when you saw that painting, you understood it as a whole scene. But it's really just a bunch of dots. And this is what happens in Ferris Bueller's Day Off is Cameron stares at it and he sort of, the camera zooms in until Cameron is just staring at these dots. Your brain sees these dots and combines them into figures. So you are seeing in this close up a figure of a man with a mustache. No one actually painted the figure of a man with a mustache as a whole figure. It's just a bunch of dots and it's in the shape. 
of a man with a mustache and our brain sees the man with the mustache instead of seeing all the little dots. If we didn't have that ability, we would look at this and go, well, that's a bunch of dots. So Gestalt theory is the idea that we see the whole. Our brain takes these dots, groups them, and lets us understand that this is a figure of a man. So you see the whole, oh look, it's a figure of a man. And then you can go in and sort of see the parts. Once you've under, you know, once your brain has seen this and gone, oh, it's a man, then it goes, oh, it's actually a bunch of dots. So you see the whole first. And so in Gestalt theory, we have a saying, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And what that means is that the viewer takes in the whole scene before it takes in the individual pieces. And so as designers and photographers, that means we really have to care about the whole scene. We can't have a photograph that's really good in one part and crummy in the other. We see the whole thing. It's not about the individual parts. It's about how they come together to create a whole picture and how that whole picture communicates. And the Gestalt laws describe what happens when we see the whole. So the Gestalt, the Gestalt theorists weren't trying to understand perception. They were, trying to under, they were trying to explain and break down that process of seeing a whole thing. So it was trying to understand when we see those dots, what name can we give to the process of seeing a man instead? And there's several gestalt, th gestalt theory laws that we're going to look at. Now, there's differences from different theorists on what these laws are. So if you've had other classes and you've learned laws that you don't see here, that's why. For this, per the purpose of this class, we're going to consider two main Gestalt theory laws. One of them we're going to break down further into five laws. So the first is figure ground relationship, and the second is prognons. Prognons means conciseness. This is the tendency of your visual perception, of your ability to see, to try to make things more simple, <laughs> to take a mess of objects and simplify it. Now, within prognons, we have five laws, and it can be hard to tease out the difference between these because they work together so often. And as I go through the lecture, you'll start to see that it's, you don't have a photograph that only has proximity. Your photograph will probably use all of these or most of these laws. So let's look at some definitions and examples for each of these things. And for each, I'm going to show photography examples and design examples. And your assignments in this class will require you to both photograph and design. So that's why we're going to look at photography and design examples. I want you to be a good photographer and this is a class called digital image design so it's important that you understand photography but above that I want you to understand good design. Good photography follows from good understanding of design. If you can design you can design a lot of different things. My brother for example designs motion graphics for movie trailers. So when you watch the Toy Story 3 movie trailer and at the end the Toy Story 3 logo kind of like appears to inflate and pop up on the screen, he made that. His background is actually in film design and music, but he's a good designer. He understands the design principles and he just applies them to different things. So he applies them to the design of moving logos and moving type. He's also a very good poster designer because he takes the same design principles and applies them to posters. So being a good designer is going to help you in a lot of different fields, including photography. So I don't want you just to learn about photography. I want you to learn about the art and science of design and perception so that you'll be a good photographer and a good designer and a good app designer. Uh, my background is actually in newspaper design, and now I design visual interfaces for interactive products. If you can design, you can design. So I want you to get experience with design and photography. And a good example is you have an upcoming project, the photo essay. You're going to include photos, but I'm also going to have you make a poster for your photo essay so that you understand how to use those photos. Being a good photographer is great. You need to be able to learn how to use those photos. How do you present them? How do you incorporate visual communication design strategies like incorporating text? So let's talk about the Gestalt laws. First, figure ground relationship. 
This is the mind deciding what is important and what is not the key focus of the, the image. So the mind has to decide, you know, what is it we're looking at here? When you see me pop up on the screen, your mind decides that I'm what you're paying attention to and that all this stuff behind me is not as important. That's what the figure ground relationship is. Something with shape or form, such as myself in the video, is what your brain decides to look at. Something that's unformed, that doesn't appear to have lots of shape, is considered the background. So we look at the form first. It appears as more important than the background. Let's look at some photo examples. This is a photo by Diane Arbus, one of my favorite photographers, and it's immediately clear what the subject of this photo is because the subject is the figure. So the two lovers on the left have a shape, a shape that we recognize. The poster on the right also has a shape, a shape that we recognize. And so these two elements become the figures. They become what we see as the subject of the picture. The background, whether it's a wall or a screen, I have no idea. It's not important. There's nothing happening there. It's unformed. There's no shape to it. It doesn't have information. So we immediately see this image and we see the two lovers on the left and the two lovers on the right and we gather that this image is a story about intimacy. This is a photograph by a famous war photographer and he explores subjects of uh, war and sending people from one culture into another culture and the effects of war on the culture where the war takes place and immediately we see a figure which is the soldier. The sky in the background is kind of unformed. There's nothing to it. It doesn't have information. There's nothing there. If we took the soldier and the landscape out of this, it would literally be like a white square. It doesn't have information. So our eye sees this image as a whole and we see it as a soldier in a location, but we know that the soldier is the subject because it has a shape. This is a really moving photograph and I'm going to use it several times. It's a very sad photograph. It won um, one of the categories for the World Press Photographer Competition last year. And the photograph is called Nicolette at the Orphanage. And I apologize, I'm like going to get a little emotional when I talk about this. Um, in this picture, immediately we see the subject, Nicolette, because she's a figure against a ground. And Nicolette um, is a a uh, girl living in Poland whose mother was uh, sentenced to prison and her father was deemed unfit to care for her and so she was sent to an orphanage. And so immediately you understand that this is a picture about Nicolette. This is not a picture about the orphanage really. It's not a picture about the wall. It's not a picture about the books or the stuff. It's a picture about Nicolette and that's because she has a figure against a, sh a unformed background, which is just a blank blue wall. Um, what's moving about this picture is just the barrenness of the ground. There's so much ground here. Most of this picture is unformed nothingness. And that is meant to hint at the emotional response we're supposed to have. It's supposed to show the situation that Nicolette lives in, that she's surrounded by lack of Form. She's surrounded by a sort of void. There's something missing in her life. So not only does the figure help us understand this picture is about her and that she's a subject, but the fact that most of this picture is ground sends a message about Nicolette and her life. Let's look at a design. This is a design uh, a poster for a photography exhibition. What this designer has done that's really smart is they've identified the areas of ground and they've put their verbal message in those areas. So with the picture, the bridge is the figure. And then there's lots of ground. There's sky, there's beach. These are ground areas. And the designer has placed the figure of the text, text is always a figure, on top of those grounds. And that helps us understand the different figures that we should pay attention to here. So it's very clear that this is a figure, this is a figure, and this is a figure. So your, your brain says, okay, there's three things. Matt Lucas, picture of a bridge, information. The designer could have screwed up here if they tried to put this over the bridge putting figures on top of each other creates confusion.
Now here's an example of putting figures on top of each other to create confusion that actually works. This is a photograph from a series on illegal apartments in Hong Kong. Living in Hong Kong is prohibitively expensive, and so people create illegal apartments between buildings, on balconies, um, in closets, in abandoned buildings. People are creating these makeshift apartments that are technically illegal. So when you look at this picture, everything is a figure. Everything has shape. It's so hard to see a ground. There's kind of a ground here around these kids, which helps the kids stand out a little bit, but mostly this is figures. And in this case, that makes sense for the image. This set of photos is exploring what life is like for the people who live in these tiny illegal apartments. And what is life like? It's cramped, it's claustrophobic, it's not ideal. So the fact that we have lots of figures overlapping and creating confusion is good for this image. It sends the message that of what life is like for the people who live in these places. It communicates. Just the fact that the figures are jump, you know, jumbled together communicates what life is like for these people. So a brilliant execution in using figure and ground. Now here's an example of using the same strategy, putting figures kind of jumbled together, but it doesn't work. This image is supposed to communicate claustrophobia. It's supposed to communicate confusion and closeness and tightness. This image is supposed to sell the bedding in the image. It's not supposed to confuse me. So when I see type, a figure on top of the figure of the bed, it's awkward, it's weird. We have two figures on top of each other. The text is supposed to be describing the figure of the bedding, but I can't really make sense of either figure because they're overlapped. And as a result, I'm confused. And I should not be confused if you're trying to sell me something. If you're trying to sell me something, I should be excited about it. I should think that it's neat. I shouldn't be confused. So this is a failure of that technique. It would have been better if the designer had taken that text and put it up where the sky is because that's more of a ground. It's unformed. Yeah, there's buildings, but they're kind of grayed out and it's hard to tell what they are. So that would be a great place for the text. Let's talk about proximity, another law of prognons. The mind decides what goes together. When you view a scene or an image, your brain imagines that things that are close are related and things that are not close are not related. And we can use this to communicate. So here's another image from our war photographer from earlier. What is the sense you get from this image? Well, your brain creates groups through proximity. So you see two groups. A group of people on the left, they're conceptually related, they're all together. A group on the right, a soldier and a donkey. This is a different group. He's not part of the group on the left. So this communicates the distance between the people who live in the nation where the war is happening and the people who have come in, the soldiers who have been sent in, who are very clearly in this picture, not part of that group. So it's meant to make you think about what happens when people who are part of a different culture go into a culture and have to interact with those people. And you see that they're not really interacting in this picture. Another example of proximity in this image, you see the two little girls are sort of embracing each other. So they are very close and they're seen as a group. Whereas the people on the right, the men up on the platform are close. And so they're a different group. So you, again, we have the idea of two different groups and this raises the question of what it's like for these two groups to interact and shows how these groups are sort of interfering with each other. Back to Nicolette at the orphanage, um, what I think is so moving and just absolutely soul crushing and heartbreaking about this picture is that not only is Nicolette a figure against the ground, but she's part of a group. And the group that she's part of, because of proximity, she's very close to a pile of toys that have very clearly been thrown in a box and stuck in the corner. And so Nicolette becomes just another thing in this conceptually related group. Just like the toys, she's been sort of stuck in the corner and forgotten about. So part of the power of this image is the proximity. Um, this would be a moving image if it were just Nicolette by herself in the corner, but the fact that she becomes part of a group of toys and a garbage bag 
is just absolutely communicative. Um, really gets you thinking about what life is like for Nicolette and makes you think about how society views kids like Nicolette who are sent to orphanages in this culture. Um, a design example, now that I've thoroughly saddened everyone, um, using groups. So putting things in proximity that are conceptually related. In this example, the title and the author are together at the top. So Michael Childers, Icons and Legends, it's close. So those things are related. And then we have the figure of Andy Warhol here in the center. And the features of his face create a different group, which is his face. And then at the bottom, we have a third group, which is more information. So the designer has very smartly taken different concepts and separated them by proximity or distance. So the title and the author are up at the top. Separate from that is Andy Warhol's face. Separate from that is the information. Instead of trying to cram it all together and make it all go together, they've made three very clearly defined groups by proximity. Let's talk about the law of similarity. The mind decides what goes together based on things that look related. So things that look similar are related. Things that are not similar, our brain says, mm, they're not related. So a good example is this photo from a photo essay called A Lingerie League of Their Own. This photo essay explores a women's football league and the transition that the, the league is making. The league started out being called, I think, lingerie football league and or lingerie, yeah, lingerie football league. And now it's called, uh, legendary football league. And so the women's football league is going through a transition from, you know, let's put women in bikinis on the field to let's actually take women's football seriously. So in this image, we see camaraderie between these women and we understand that they're part of a team because they look similar. They're wearing the same outfits, the same uniforms, and that enhances the communicative message here that these women are part of a team, that they're friends, you know, they're goofing around together here. None of them are really separate. Even the woman in the middle is wearing the same thing as the others. Another example uh, from the uh, World Press Photo Contest, a photo of blind Indian albino boys living in um, a building for young blind men. And they're dressed very similar and they look very similar. So immediately we get a sense that, you know, these are people who are facing a life that is different from others. You know, they're, they're not um, living the same life as you and me, but they have a group. They're part of a group, that there's a community of people like this. So the similarity enhances the message that there's a whole community of people um, who go through this life experience. Another interesting photo, and I'd just like to preface this by saying I've looked up more information about this photo online, and I haven't been able to find whether the subject of the photo prefers, like what pronoun they prefer to be called by, whether the subject prefers to be referred to um, in the masculine or the feminine. I can't find that out. I don't see it recorded anywhere. So just for the sake of clarity, I'm going to refer to the subject um, in the masculine pronoun. And what's going on here is we have similarity helping us understand a message. So on the right, we have women who are looking in the same direction. They're all women and they're all dressed in these sort of long skirts. So they have a lot similar with each other. They're looking to the left. And then here in the center, we have the subject who looks different. Um, he's facing a different way. He's facing the camera directly. Uh, he's standing in a more sort of power pose, whereas the women on the right are standing, you know, with their arms together in a, a less powerful pose. So we're using similarity in the opposite. We're using difference here, actually. So we understand that the subject is different from the three people over on the right. And so we see this idea of separation and difference. And this is from a photo essay about um, an organization that helps uh, the gay community in this community in, in this community. So this is a photo essay about kind of what daily life is like for the men and women who are part of this organization and who are trying to promote tolerance and understanding of their lifestyle. So having the difference shows a lot. 
um, in this image. It communicates a lot. This is someone who's different, but the way he's being different, it's not cowering in a corner. He's being different by being sort of powerful and by being forward facing and standing differently. So that communicates the message that he's different and he embraces that. In this design, we're using similarity to group. So the photos at the top are all black and white photos. They're all rectangles. That's clearly one thing. So when we see that, we see a collage instead of separate pictures. And then fragments, the Hamilton photographs, is in the same typeface and it's text. So it has two similarities and we see that as a group. And then at the bottom, we have some white space and then we see another group. Continuation, another law of prognons. The mind continues lines. In photography, we call this leading lines. We think of things that are lined up as being related, and we think of things that are not lined up as being not related. The eye follows lines as if they are pointers. So in photography, we always want to be aware of what the lines are and whether they're pointing to our subject or whether they are distracting from our subject. So going back to the lingerie league photo, if we look at the lines, we have some eye lines. Uh, the mind follows where people are looking. So we have um, three of these women are looking right at the woman in the center. And so that draws attention to the woman in the center. We also have the line of the group. They're sort of standing in a circle. And so our mind fills in this line and it continues the line. It says, oh, this is you know, something's happening here. And as we follow that line of people, we go right over the subject. We go right over her face. So different elements of this photo are pointing us toward the subject in the center so that attention is given to her and that she becomes the dominant subject or focus of this picture. Same device, leading lines, is used in this image. We follow the lines of the way these boys are standing and it brings us right to the center to the subject in the center. And so our mind sees this boy in the center as sort of the main subject of this picture. This photograph has some really excellent leading lines. All of the women on the right are looking right at our subject on the left. And then we have the line of the, um, the sort of drying line, the laundry line is also leading right to our subject. And then we have these lines of the building, even though they're broken here, we sort of continue that. Our eye sees all these lines and continues in and takes us right to the subject. So there's so many leading lines here that you can't not see this man as the main subject of this picture and take in the power of his pose. Um, in this example, which we haven't seen yet, again, we have leading lines. The lines point to the subject the penguin. So we have this trail of bubbles, which takes us up to the painting and uh, suggests movement. It suggests a quick, powerful movement by this penguin. We also have the lines of ice, which are pointing right to the penguin. Another picture we haven't seen yet, but a great example of leading lines. What's so great about these leading lines is they indicate motion. When you see this image, it's so dynamic. It's all about forward movement. All of the lines are going horizontal. And so we see the horizontal movement of this little girl jumping. And we see the power and the movement in her jump. She doesn't appear, I mean, it's very clear that she's moving forward. She's not like jumping straight up and down. You really get the sense of forward movement and the power that she must have in order to make such a long, dis, you know, long forward movement. Um, another example of leading lines, this is from um, a series on the fennec fox, a species which is um, being sort of hunted to extinction, and we have these wonderful leading lines. The line of the rope on this fox takes us right to the fox, and not only does it emphasize the fox, but it emphasizes the captivity of this fox. And then we actually have a line here in the center where the, um, or the center, the sort of center of the fox, uh, we have the corner of the room provides a line pointing right at the fox. So that emphasizes the communicative message of this image. This message here is supposed to indicate captivity and that's supposed to be, it's supposed to show the kind of fear of the animal. And, 
that communicates the message of sort of this fear of captivity, and the leading lines take us right to the subject of this image. Now, in design, we can take advantage of leading lines as well. Uh, in this example, you'll see that the natural habitats is placed sort of within the bear hug of the subject to the left. So instead of putting it like on the right or in the top left corner, it's right in the center and the man on the left seems to be sort of enveloping it with his arms. So we follow the line of his arms and it goes around natural habitats and causes natural habitats to appear to be the subject of this picture. He's also looking up at the Sam Christmas Presents. So the leading lines are taking us to the verbal information, the textual information of this image, which then becomes the subject. All right, we're, we've got two more. Um, closure, the mind connects unfinished shapes. So things that can be connected can make a shape. Things that can't be connected, we imagine that they're not a shape. So the idea here, what's really important is that an unfinished, unfinished form can be understood. In this image, we understand that this is a whale or shark tail. We understand it as the tail of an animal, even though it's cut off. We don't need the whole image of the tail to understand what it is. And the fact that it is cut off tells us right away that this animal is dead and that it's been hunted or poached. So the fact that it's cut off communicates, but we can still understand what it is. This is a really great example of closure. We don't need to see the whole horse here to understand what's happening. This is called polo fall. It's very clear that this man is about to be crushed by this horse and that we're witnessing a really horrible moment in this event. And we see his reaction and he becomes the subject of this picture. If we could see the whole horse, this photo would be much less powerful because the horse is so big and different that it would be the subject. It's not the subject. The important thing here isn't that the horse fell down. The important thing here is the person and what happened to him. So by cutting off the horse, this is a much more powerful picture. We don't need to see the top of the horse to know this is a horse. Our mind fills in the rest of the horse and understands what this is. Now we can use this in design as well. In design, we don't need to see everything to see, to make sense of it. So this R is cut off. It doesn't matter. We can tell that it's an R. Our eye closes the rest of the shape. Same with the circles. We know these are circles. We're not like confused about why there's half circles on here. We get the sense that this design has lots of circles. And where it says myths and truths, it's kind of cut off. We can still read that. Our eye just continues the M, the Y, the T. It's closure in action. Finally, the last law of prognons, common fate. This is the idea that the mind connects objects going in the same direction. So things that are going in the same direction are seen as related and things that are going in opposite directions are seen as not related or possibly adversarial. So in this example, we have uh, birds and they're all looking and flying in the same direction. So we see them as a herd, you know, we see them as a group of birds, flock, flock is the word. Uh, we see them as a flock of birds. We see them as related. In this example, this is a really good example. This is actually a photo of a festival at which 21 people were crushed to death by the crowd. So in this image, if you try to follow the common fate, there isn't one. There is no common fate to follow. All the arms are pointing in different directions. All the faces are looking in different directions. And the result is chaos. It's very similar to that image of the illegal apartment in Hong Kong where there's so many figures, it's confusing. There's so many fates here. There's so many things pointing in directions. And none of it lines up and it's confusing. And that's exactly what this photo is trying to communicate. It's trying to communicate the sheer panic and horror and awfulness of this event. And it does so by showing the confusion and the chaos. So there is no common fate here. And that's used to communicate what's going on in the photo and why this was an important story. This is another photo from the Lingerie League. And here we see common fates it's kind of like an adversarial fate. Instead of these women looking in the same direction, they're looking at each other so that their eye line hits in the middle and we immediately understand this is adversarial. They don't have a common fate. In fact, their fates 
bump up against each other. And so we understand that this is a photo about competition. Last but not least, an example of design. This kind of design has been really popular recently, taking typography and sort of putting everything on different lines. This uses common fate. This type of design relies on common fate. Lines that go in the same direction we see as related. So we know that this is a paragraph here. And then we know that this and this are related because they have common fate. And then we know that all of this stuff is related here. These become clear groups because of the, cl the common fate of these objects. Okay, that's everything that I wanted to talk about. This week for homework, what you're gonna do is you're gonna answer some prompts about Gestalt theory. And don't forget that you need to cite the readings and the lecture because I wanna make sure that you read them, that you watch the video, but you're also going to photograph and then explain how your photographs use these Gestalt laws. So I want you to be very careful to specifically go out and photograph things that use these laws. Go for a walk in your neighborhood. If you live in an apartment complex that has a pond, think about how the pond might have a leading line and how you might use that line to show some element of the pond. So I want you to go out and photograph photos, photos that are interesting that use these laws. So what I mean by photos that are interesting is don't like set up a picture, like don't draw a picture and photograph that. Um, don't set up a picture by like putting your phone next to something and saying, oh, it's similarity. I want you to actually take pictures of things as you see them. Be more journalistic. Go for a walk in your neighborhood. Find an abandoned building. Um, find an interesting person that you can follow around for an hour or two. Take photographs that are going to have meaning because I want you to communicate with the photographs. I don't want you just to show the Gestalt law. I want you to create a photograph that has meaning and the Gestalt law emphasizes that meaning because I want you to be able to write about, you know, this shows the Gestalt law of closure and the reason this photograph communicates is because of that closure, because blank. So if you have any questions, feel free to send them my way. I'd be glad to answer them. But that's everything I wanted to say about Gestalt theory, so I look forward to seeing the photograph.